it would be my honor. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. <laughs> we are we are here to hear the speaker. Like when I was here last time, we had I think Fred Thomas and, and so hold your questions and comments to the end. Um, we'll kind of go around. If you have a question, and then everybody gets a question, and then if we have time, then we'll go around and get another round of questions. So anyway, would you please uh, show our speaker the respect that we're known to typically give in. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. One of the very first things we do when we go to the legislature is we elect our leadership team. And um, it's a very, very important decision. Who are we going to choose to lead us in this? It feels much like a war after you've been there for a while. And um, these are our confidants and our, and our generals, the generals of our team. And, um, the traits that you would look for in a majority leader, as you can imagine, someone who uh, is steadfast and principled, someone you can count on under to be graceful under pressure, uh, to stand their ground when they need to, to be open and honest with their communication skills during difficult times, because as you can imagine, trying to get 58 Republicans to agree on anything is incredibly difficult. And that is the job of the majority leader, is to be an a liaison. Um, when our communications break down, he has to try to merge those different, opinion, different opinions. And we elected this man. And um, I have to be honest. When I first met Brad, way back in 2015, I thought, oh, that guy, he's that big, good-looking guy. You know, he's not going to have anything inside. He's not going to have any death. I could not have been more wrong on that. This man is tried, true, and tested. I am honored to serve with him. One of the first incredible impressions he made upon me was when he introduced his wife and introduced her as P31 woman, a Psalms 31 woman. <laughs> um, a wife of noble character. And he had me in the back crying because I'm like, that would be wonderful to be introduced like that. I also want you to know that he fought for all of us, uh, particularly the legis legislators, when he took on Governor Bullock in his inappropriate use of the state plane. And he called him on it, and I don't know if you know the story, but he called him on it, um, and he took him to task on it, and the COPP, the last COPP we had, was definitely the henchman for the governor, and uh, it got really, really ugly and nasty. Are you going to talk about that at all? Okay, you can give him the highlights. But at any rate, this he's not a man of tremendous resources, but he took him to task on his own dime, stood for us, fought for us, and won. Ultimately won on an appeal. And of him, I am so proud to serve with him. And I want, I share that with you so that you can have a little insight as to this man's character. He is truly, he truly has the heart of a warrior with a servant spirit. And that's a rare commodity in the life. I give you bread, Chief. Thank you, well, thank you very much. <laughs> you first say that's very humbly because uh, you, know, you, you never really know how you're going to measure up to people how you're going to measure up to yourself. When Teresa mentioned the, the battle with the COPP, um, there, was, there was help from other folks. There were people who uh, donated their time and resources, raised money to help us offset some of the costs that we had. But anyone who's familiar with what the COPP has done in the past, not this particular one, because I think the gentleman who's serving in that capacity now is doing a respectable job. He's not confrontational. He's not a, uh, a pit bull going after folks. The previous gentleman, was not that kind of an individual. And actually threatened me on the radio, threatened me in the news with criminal prosecution. And I wasn't really sure. My little brother spent 20 years in the Air Force. And he said there's a fine line between bravery and stupidity. <laughs> and his job was to blur the line. And it must be a family trait. Because when somebody said you're brave by doing this, I didn't know if it was bravery or if it was rashness. 
but I was assured by the attorney that represented me that he thought we had a great opportunity to basically address an unconstitutional provision in the state MCA code. And that's exactly what happened. We were able to have that determined uh, to be unconstitutional in part by the federal district judge, Brian Morris in Helena. But because he found that that only applied to elected officials, we had to go to the Ninth Circuit Court. And people know that the Ninth Circuit is a pretty liberal court. But their bias is First Amendment rights. So back in the 60s when they became a, a real activist sort of court, it was for First Amendment issues. Well, that's what we were talking about in this particular case. So we were able to prevail. And the good news is my attorney is going to get most of the money he should have gotten. We're talking about a bill that probably ran forty to $50,000. And when I was threatened by the COPP, and I'm laughing because it's, it's not past history, there were 94 legislators on an email that I sent out a note to, basically thinking I was operating under Article 2, Section 8, I believe, of the Constitution, that, is that correct? That gives us uh, immunity to speak as legislators when we're talking about legislative business. At any rate, uh, the COPP said, no, that's not true. You communicate with 94 people. The maximum penalty for each one of those is $1,000. So my wife is looking at a $94,000 bill with wings flying out of the house. <laughs> so it didn't happen, fortunately. So and thanks again, Trish, for the introduction. I want to say this note that's sitting on the desk uh, disqualifies my family from having Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners. If you can't do any of these things, we're going to have to stop meeting because this, if you, Teresa, I'll give you the copy of it if you want it, oh, has to do with disorderly conduct. Oh, okay. Okay. And somebody asked me, how did I, how did I prepare for the legislature? By being born into the family that I was born into. I have five brothers and one sister. And we're all kind of a group of knuckleheads. But uh, my family moved out here from Minnesota in 1963 when I was nine years old. So I am not a native Montana. First generation. I happened to marry, uh, as Teresa was talking about, a woman who's far above my pay grade. Uh, her, her dad is the great grandson of a gentleman who homesteaded in the Vitterer and actually founded or developed uh, Medicine Hot Springs, uh, George S. Lord. He was a dentist, as my father in law was, but he also practiced on the opposite end of the body because he had handbills that said, Dentistry, I work on piles. You know, and I thought, I hope he works from the top down because I think his clientele probably appreciated that. So my wife is, I think, a fifth generation Montana. My kids are six. My grandkids are seven. And I'm speaking of grandchildren. The last time I spoke to a group, my, my number three grandchild, my, my granddaughter Olivia was there, and I had her doing one thing for me, and that was assessing how many times I used the term um, or I said, you know. And she noted that the first time I used that as an example, said, so there you did it. I said, that doesn't count. It counts when I'm in the midst of the speech. So I'm sad not to have her there. So I'm the second of seven. As I mentioned, I have an older brother who's uh, spent 28 years in the Air Force. Retired as a senior chief master sergeant. I'm very proud of Jeff. He did things that you know, a lot of people would never do in their careers. I have one younger sister, the youngest of the seven. And she's, a, she's probably tougher than most men that I know. <laughs> a great young lady, uh, 15 years younger than I am, so she just turned 50. I spent most of my life in seven different careers. I was a dean of students for seven, for 11 years. I worked in private business, owned my own business. Uh, finished off my last career, if you will, as 11 and a half years as a dairy ingredient salesperson in Montana. Montana has no dairy business. The largest dairy concern in Montana is the hood rates. So we did business around the country. So I was talking to people from Wisconsin, California, Texas, New York, Idaho, Arizona. Idaho is the number three daring state in the country. Just for just a little tidbit when you walk away. They're combat they're beating, they're uh, battling with New York State for that three and four spot. Legislative background, I was elected in 2015 to represent House District 97, which is the west end of Missoula. There's a little community out there by the, the name of Elmar Estates, and I have a daughter who lives there. We live just past that, so we're about 600 feet outside the district. That's probably 35% of the district population. The other big district population center is Lowell. 
My family uh, moved out into that area in 1970 when I was a sophomore in high school. So I'm very familiar with the area. I know a lot of people out there. Just by circumstance, when you live in an area, you get to meet people. So I was fortunate to be asked to run. I ran and beat a gentleman who was a former Utah Fish and Game Commissioner. And I felt very uncertain about what I was doing. It's sort of like a dog chasing a car. What do you do when you catch it? And that's where I was at, going to the legislature. I didn't know anything about it. So the first thing I did was read the Constitution. Because I felt like that was a good idea to know what your job is. No. And I found it invaluable because I found four things, and perhaps there's others, but I haven't discovered them, that we are responsible for as public servants, legislators. And that is to take care of education, to take care of natural resource production development, to take care of the necessary infrastructure and to take care of police and fire. Those are really the four things we're mandated to do in the legislature or as a governing body. We tend to go well beyond that because of the social creep that we've seen since the foundation of the, the state of Montana. We just progressively allow a little bit to happen and then when that does happen, it's hard to do that. So, as Teresa mentioned, I was uh, selected as majority leader and it's hard to describe that position because it's somebody who helps with the day-to-day -day activities that go on in the legislature, but oftentimes you're sort of the place where people come to them. <laughs> now, one of the things I try to do, I try to reach out to individuals within our caucus when they had difficult legislation or something that was perhaps challenging or needed some, some input that I may have had from, from the past, or I could provide resources that would help them out. So that was part of the job, to be available. When I was a dean of students, I, was, I, was, I taught manners at two high schools. I was a guy that dealt with the students who were just like me in high school. So I dealt with 20% of the population that was always trying to figure out a way to get away with something. <laughs> and I was very creative in how I dealt with that. And so I think that creativity came into play a little bit in the legislature. But as I mentioned, I tried to let the office that I occupied, which belongs to the people of the state of Montana, it does not belong to the majority of the majority leader sits in that for a 90 day period. I made it available to people so that they could come in and talk. If they had questions, they could stop by. And it turned out to be a pretty good respite for folks. They would come in every now and then, somebody would blow up. But for the most part, there weren't that many challenging issues that we had to deal with that occurred on the House floor or occurred in committees. My first two terms, I served on the Appropriations Committee. And that was, that's hard work. It's very tough. Represent Balance, Representative Beatty, both serve on that. That is a difficult job because you've got to account for the, the monies that the state brings in in taxes that you have to apportion where they are deemed to be best utilized. And it's a challenging process. This last go around, because I was in leadership, it felt like it would be better for me not to serve on that committee. So I served on the education committee. And that was interesting because you got to be on it. Appropriations is all about money. Education and the other committees like those are about the policies. And you have to identify what it is that's going to be effective or you hope is going to be effective and then meld that together with the dollars that are available. So that was that's kind of a little bit of a background of my legislative history. My mentors in 2015-27 were made on measurable outcomes and metrics. We talked about that particularly as it had to do with the Department of Public Health and Human Services. We constantly get bombarded in the legislature with requests for money. That's what it's all about. You have people who are hired to do this. They come and say, give us money. And I, I was the chair of Section A Subcommittee uh, of Appropriations General Government. My second term, I served on my first term. And my, about the third meeting we had, people came in and said the following. Our department is the most important department of state government. You absolutely can't cut the money that you're giving to us. So the second person that got up and said that, I stopped them and I addressed the recording because every meeting that you have at the legislature is either video and audio recorded or just audio recorded. And I said, for the people who are listening in, I want you to hear this. If you're going to come to this committee and say our department 
our committee, our entity, is the most important in state government, so you can't cut our funding, then here's your challenge. You come to me with whoever it is that's going to cut a dollar out of their budget. Because if you're asking for all your money and there's not enough money to go around, somebody's got to be cut. So we're going to ask you to determine where those dollars are going to come from. And I think it's still important that we look at measurable outcomes for all of us. We have to know what it is that we're doing, whether we're working in the public sector, the private sector, in a marriage. When I got married 37 years ago, there were three things they challenged me about. Love, honor, and obey. Those are pretty tough. Sometimes you don't like the person you're with. Sometimes it's hard, I mean, you have to honor them. But the obey part is really tough. <laughs> so you learn how to do that. You learn how to work with your spouse because I don't know about the rest of you, maybe my marriage is unique, but I was told that if there isn't a little bit of tension in a relationship, then one of you isn't necessary. And I'm just here to tell you my wife and I have been as necessary as Gwen's did. So there is some tension, there is some friction, but we work through that because we know we, we have a shared goal. You know, we got married and we committed ourselves in a covenant. And the difference between a covenant and a contract is pretty simple, but I didn't discover it until a short time ago. A contract tells you what is yours. A covenant tells you who is yours and whose you are. So my wife and I have a covenant, and we know that that arrangement, that agreement, is more important to us than anything else. So we settle our differences on it. One of the things I'm hoping to do in this particular session, this particular interim, I'm going to be serving on the Energy Transportation Interim Committee. I want to make sure we continue to work on the things that unite us up. That's really critical. That's probably the most important thing we can do. We just got done with our U or the uh, MT GOP Leadership Convention, where there was members of the leadership Team, new, new members were selected. Uh, Don Klotschmidt from Kalispell Minerals, Don K was selected as a chair, Lola Sheldon Galloway as a vice chair. So we've got, we have got a, a new team of position that's now trying to continue the good work done by Terry Nelson and his group and push forward the ideology and beliefs of the Republican Party in Montana, the Rep Republican Party platform. Because that to me is our, that's what separates us from the Democrats. It tells us what we're supposed to do in the panel. You know, maybe not 100% how we're supposed to do it, but these are the goals and objectives that we're supposed to accomplish. And this is what we're attempting to do. So we've got a good leadership team in position. They hit the ground running. The very first day after the convention, they were reaching out to folks saying, what can we do to better serve you? We want to get together with various groups so that we are communicating our position to you and you are communi communicating your position back. Much like what Teresa did as a whip in the last session, not the most immediate past session, but in 2017, you're the liaison between everyone on the floor and leadership, and from leadership to everyone on the floor. And it can't be a top-down kind of operation. It's got to be a bottom-up. I'm, I'm a big believer that if we're not doing something right, you call people on that and say, you need to make these modifications. But you do it in a way that helps them identify their deficiencies, and helps them improve what those deficiencies are. It's got to be a two-way street. If you're not effectively leading, I believe it's the responsibility of those who are part of that group, that body, that they communicate with you where your deficiencies lie so that you can improve them. I mean, when you're sitting in a classroom when you're a kid, I won't bring any of this back to that point, but I'm going to anyway. You're being assessed on an ongoing basis. But if all the teacher does is says, that's wrong, you're never going to get it, Pretty quick, you're going to close up. So that a good teacher, somebody who inspires kids to learn, who's going to light the fire rather than fill the bucket, comes to them and says, where's your challenge at? Where's your difficulty at? What can I do to help you out? I have, well, actually five children. Four of them are, are living. My number three child has some learning disabilities. He's dyslexic. He's dysgraphic. If you make him read something, he couldn't tell you in grade school, high school, what was in the material. Now he can, but it took him a while to get over there. But if you read it to him or said, showed him how to do it or had him do it, it just clicked. So you have to identify what makes people learn, work, and understand things better. So,
I'd really like to spend more time kind of talking about questions that you guys have, comments that you have. I have a dental appointment at 2 o'clock, so I've got to get out of here about 1.15, be on the road at 1.15. But, you know, it was an honor. To, it's been an honor serving the legislature. I never thought I was going to. I thought about it when I was about 32 years old. My wife threatened me at gunpoint saying, not going to happen. we got four small children. You're staying home. and going to be a dad. I said, okay. So when, when I went, it was because I was asked to run. I considered it. It seemed like a good thing to do. We were successful three times. So now the, the challenge ahead of me and my wife and I are still discussing it is, what do we do with term number four? And I, I, I'm, I haven't made any official determination. Because the three options are, do you do something, we, something legislatively, do you do something different? And trust me, it's not going to be running for lieutenant governor or governor or U.S. House or any of those spots. I have no desire to do that. <coughs> or do nothing at all. And that kind of sounds good. I semi-retired about 18 months ago. And that do nothing is got an appeal. <laughs> My grand, no. same granddaughter that was writing down the you knows and the ums, and those are just for illustration, don't anybody record those at the event. She said, look, you get to do all the things that you wanted to do when you were working. I said, yeah, what are those? Because I just continue to do the same kind of things I was doing before, only they're sort of household for you. But I'm enjoying the ability to step away from work and serve in the legislature. So I would just say, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about things that went on. I would just as soon respond to questions and do my best to answer them uh, that, that folks have. So, uh, yeah, well, well, wait, yeah. wait, 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 okay. A, a couple things. Number one, regarding that list, you will have a list presented to you as soon as you retire. Oh, I, have, well, I did. Yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. okay. And number two, you'll be, I'm sure, like most of us in the room, I've never been more busy since I retired than, and I don't know how I could ever go to work. <laughs> I mean, at this point in my life, and um, as some of you know, I got here because I didn't show up one day and run. Uh, I said, guess what? <laughs> I said, okay, fine. So anyway, I came across something in the Bible, and we don't usually do a lot of that stuff in here other than yeah, here's our Bible, for sure. But, but in any event, Ecclesiastics 10.2, and this, this really hit me when, when we're talking about Republicans and Democrats, etc. Does anybody know that verse? Ecclesiastics 10.2? Yeah. Are you going through the card file? Yeah, I know. I know. Okay, anyway, here, here we go. I had to write it down. A wise man's heart inclines to their right, and the heart of a fool to the left. And I just kind of, you know, the big fellow back in the day, man, I'm telling you what, he knew what we were about today, 2,000 and some years ago when they started writing all this stuff down. And I was reading some other stuff this morning, and I won't, I won't go into it, but it's amazing how clear some things that come to you when you're in there, you go, and it, it applies today. It's kind of like our founding fathers. The things that they wrote back in the Constitution and in, uh, what our, uh, here's our historian here, but in any event, the things that they wrote down for us today, it's amazing where that come from. And there's things, of course they didn't talk about nuclear bombs and Iran and all this kind of stuff, but they did talk about the Iran area. So in any event, with that, um, do you, uh, who has some questions for Brad? Ed, Ed was first, I'm sorry. You, you, you talked about appropriation, and you talked about looking for new venues, I think, for the new venues. New venues? For you. Mm -hmm. You obviously want to enjoy managing change. I think that's what sums up what you said. But. I'd like to ask you about our state constitution. Do you think the balanced budget part of the constitution that's worthwhile should be there or not? At the state level or at the federal level? At the state level, absolutely. Why not at the federal level? I, I, I don't see any reason why it should not be. There well, is a schism on that, and, and it's represented in this room, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But I'm obviously an advocate. I think we should take the high ground and we can finally get state sovereignty back if we finally put the cap on our damn money. But I wondered how you felt, and I suggest to you that maybe you want to consider 
looking into that and perhaps becoming an advocate. I've had some members of uh, my my district, some constituents who've asked me about that. If you open the door for a clock, like, absolutely, it's, I'm throwing that at you because I happen to believe in it. I, I don't think we can discount anything. We have to look at options that allow us to rein in the federal, federal government grows every year by definition. Yeah. Sooner or later, the sovereignty of the state will be a go. And, and in some respects, the state government also continues to grow with, with every new dollar that comes in, we find a new program that we can spend that money on. Yeah, the fight with the budget to do it. Yeah. The fight is there. Yeah, not there. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we need to find out a way. We need to figure out a way to, to change that. And one of the best ways available to us right now is to the people out who are who continue to spend more money than, than we're bringing in. Thank you. Yeah. It wasn't at one time that um, I got up here about 20 years ago, I guess, we had a Budget when we leave, that's our only requirement as legislators is to have a balanced budget. So every dollar that, that uh, is being expended has to have a, a corresponding dollar that comes in to offset that. We can't spend anything in deficit. And actually, there was some good legislation set up in 2017. Uh, the Budget Stabilization Reserve Fund, where money goes into that can only be accessed under certain circumstances, and there's a payback provision. When certain dollars are taken out, there's a time frame and a repayment that has to go, uh, has to be applied. Those dollars have to be put back in. There's a rainy day fund, you have the fire fund, which is available for offsetting the costs of fighting fires that uh, the state may incur, but some of those are going to be paid up front and then reimbursed by the federal government. So there are there are dollars available for expenditure if we have a need for them, if we run into a situation. Much like what we had a couple of weeks ago where we heard that coal strip units one and two, which are supposed to be shuttered in 2021 or 2022, are going to be shuttered at the end of this year. And if they do, that's going to throw off the revenue projections for, 20, for 2020 and 2021. So we're going to have to take a look at that and identify what we need to do to make sure that our budget for that, by any of which we just got done with, is going to be able to be realized and actually work the budget. Nancy, you have a question? Um, I, I did actually, it was uh, one that I had not intended to ask. Uh, you mentioned that you are on the Energy Interim Committee, which I didn't realize. Uh, President announced some changes to the Clean Energy Plan. Uh, Colster 1 and 2 are closing. Colster 3 and 4, we did not make any progress on uh, getting those transferred over to another owner. So uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on Colster 3 and 4? Keeping that transmission line open, and and what are what are the prospects for uh, uh, tran that transmission line and outages prior to us coming back into session next next term? Yeah, that's that's a tough situation, as you well know. Uh, that set of Bill three thirty one, which would have allowed that uh, that transmission line, and this between Townsend is it the, the section between Townsend and, and Garrison? from the east, the entire portion, from the east to the west, yeah. So, yeah, we need that to be able to move energy. We've got folks that are opposed to having coal being used to produce energy, and I think it's going to be interesting if the folks in the state of Washington wind up having a real tough winter, and they're opposed to, what do you want to call them, black electrons rather than green electrons. If it gets cold over there, do we say, hey, sorry, no green electrons available right now, but contact us in April and May, we may have some. I think it's critical that we take a look at it, and, and perhaps the governor's going to have to intervene if it's necessary, but we need to go to whatever we can to make sure that we keep three and four open as long as possible, find new buyers for them if we can, but that the uh, bill that failed that didn't allow those, uh, those uh, KV lines to be uh, utilized by a new buyer or be kept in operation, that's a major challenge for us. And hopefully that's something we're going to be talking about a good deal when it comes to the interim uh, the Questions for the speaker? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. You talk about government programs and these types of things, and you talk about the founders. Thomas Paine said, and, and I think this is, is critical as anything, this is one of my favorite things, what we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. 
it is dearness only that gives anything its value. And that to me says if we are running welfare programs and giving things to people, they don't really appreciate it in the end. And we've seen it in public housing and these types of things. And the government has one real objective as far as I'm concerned. And that's to be as small as possible to do the absolute minimum. And we have lost half of the people in this country are socialist right now. Yeah. And I hope everybody heard what's happened today in Cuba. They can't feed their people. The Cuban government told their people to eat rats and said it tastes better than beef. And we can't allow this country to go there. And I guess what I'm getting at is We no longer have Democrats in this country. We have socialists and communists. And we have got to stop doing anything that supports anything that the Democrats want to do because everything they want to do is destruction to this country. And I guess that's not a question. It's just, just my comments and my feeling about what's happening in our country. And just to be honest with you, I'm, a, I'm scared. I'm 80 years old. It's not going to affect me, but it's going to affect everybody that's younger than me. And our youngsters think socialism is the answer. And they cannot be more wrong. How do we change this? You know, the, the entities that have brought this change about took a very long view. Yeah. And they put the frog in the pot when the water was cool and let the frog become adjusted and just continue to ratchet up the temperature one degree at a time. Our job is to turn that down as quickly as we possibly can, but we need to take a long view of that as well. The infiltration of schools, the infiltration of government, the infiltration of the media, the infiltration of entertainment, that's what's brought about the change. We have inoculated ourselves a little bit to those changes. We've allowed small steps to be taken. And pretty soon when we look back, now you're 80, I'm only 65, so there's a little bit of a difference. But I can look back to the way it was when I graduated from the 8th grade in 1968 and go, how did we get here from there? What a so, so what we need to do is look at how do we get from where we are back to those principles? And this is what's going to do it. These are the people that are going to do it along with those with whom you visit, engage, and talk. Because it's important that we can't do it on our own. We just don't have enough energy. We don't, we don't have the media or the, the visibility to be able to promote this. So ours have to be back fence, backyard, uh, grocery shop, grocery, grocery store kind of conversations about what we need to, to take the country back. But we've got, uh, contrary to a lot of people believe, we've got a lot of good young people who see the errors of their parents' ways. Now, I grew up on the tail end of the, of the, the 60s when, when things were pretty radical. And if you take a look at people who are five to 10 years older than me, their children and grandchildren are looking at them and saying, you made a hell of a mess here. We need to clean that up because they see the destruction of it. And I, I'm a believer, as you just said, Jay, about your trip back east, there are a lot of great young people, young Americans, who oppose what we see in the media every day, but we're fed this constant stream of, well, this is what socialists, or what, what the young people believe, they believe in socialism. I'm not convinced that that's the case, but I'm convinced that we need to continue to educate our children and our grandchildren as to what created the kind of country that we have and what we do to get it back on track. So it's an educational process. Yes, sir, would you please explain to us in the previous uh, session what transpired with uh, some of the bills that we were two bills that I think I understand, having to do with uh, sanctuary cities and then the follow-up bill, neither one of them we asked if I'm not mistaken. Is that how that was the two bills that I'm trying to have the if recall if there was a there's a referendum as well as a regular bill. Sanctuary City Bill seems like it's pretty important stuff. Yeah. I think part of what happened with one of those bills, I think it was probably the, the, the bill, not the referendum, was that 
it came up at a time when things were pretty heated, and I think there were votes that went against it just based on emotion. And right or wrong, those kind of things happen. I can give you, for instance, we had a, I had a bill that sailed through both houses, through both chambers, went through all the committees, and it was very well uh, received. And it, it came up in queue right after the last vote on full strip, I believe. And it went down, even though it had broad support on both sides of the aisle. And it went down. So I think the Sanctuary City Bill was a victim more of emotion than anything. Else. What was the cause of that emotion you're talking about? Somebody Bill, not liking another person in the room? Yeah. Right. Bill, yeah. Bills that they were frustrated with beforehand, things that had occurred in, in debates on the floor, particular piece of legislation that passed. So it gets that. I'll say silly that, that um, something that gets, gets kind of like this instead of just put the facts and go on it. So if something happened 20 minutes ago, or somebody was, was upset with the person across the room, that can interfere with something as important as whether you know, there can be a sanctuary city in the state of Montana. Sadly, so, so, so we're, we're, we're emotional creatures, and some, uh, sometimes you make decisions based on. Just wondering why those factors and they make something like that go wrong. Yeah, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, personally, sanction. The governor says we don't have any, any need for it because there are no sanctuary cities. Now, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think the sanctuary city bill did actually get to the governor's desk, did it not? Yes. The bill got vetoed. The bill got vetoed. The referendum failed. The referendum failed. So he yeah. got to the governor's desk. He shot it down. Shot and the referendum failed. It would have backed it up. Correct. Thank you. That's what I was trying to figure out. What happened to the wait, wait, wait. Susan, back here. You had a question. Did you have your hand up, or were you just yes. stretching? <laughs> it's, um, it's Did it get handled? Jay, <laughs> please had her hand down. <laughs> Can somebody tell me, did the 70 mile an hour for trucks pass and been signed into to law? It, it passed, I don't know that it's been signed into law yet. Okay, if it goes through, is there any plans to watch and see what happens and how many semi trucks are going to have blowouts on their trailer tires and aren't made for 70 miles an hour? I'm a transportation person. I, and I mean, on the last couple of days when I found out about it, I'm like, oh, you can't do this. Because these, this equipment's not rated for 70. And so, you know, because cars aren't paying attention to these huge things in front of them, we're going to increase the speed on trucks to beyond their safety capacity ratings of the equipment that's out there. So I'm just wondering if there's any stirrings that you guys would start to look at. That's where the safety ratings on what these trucks and trailers can do and put it back on where it really belongs because it doesn't belong on transportation. I saw him driving that, just got, that, that I did just got percolated to the top of it last night. So it's one of those things that I mean, because I, you know, I got a hold of Sharon as it was going to the floor because I hadn't okay. seen the bill. And I said, Sharon, you can't let this happen. Because what's happening is, is we have an in, you know, it doesn't like trucks, cars, you know, you can stop them and barely. Well, when you increase that 5%, and I've been trying to find a formula to have that, I can find studies at from 55 to 65 and how much longer you used to drive. You know this. How much, school bus right now, so, yeah. You understand this and how much longer it takes to stop a truck. Yeah. And how many people, I mean, we had this happen during all this time, during the bills about getting over for emergency vehicles, he sees one up the road, he gets in the left, somebody comes around the front and then sees the car and pulls in front of him. He can't see it. People don't understand that. If you can't see a driver's face, he can't see you either. So I'm hoping that you guys will start looking at, before we go willy-nilly about, because you know the insurance people want to increase all these speeds, that you know it's an increase, it's gonna be an increase in consuming fuel, which is going to raise the product, the price of every consumer. I mean, mm -hmm. you know as well as I do, there's nothing sure. that's not being touched by a truck. Right. And the safety yeah. regulations, you know, when they went up to 80, it was a big question of what's going to happen because cars won't pay it. The trucks are going one speed and the cars are going another. 
Well, I still put it back on the tr on the cars. Yeah. That we cannot have these trucks go on this road, especially if they're hauling something hazardous. Yeah. Well, so, I'm sure a lot of the companies that are responsible for their own fleet are going to look at the fuel efficiency and say, hey, look, we can drive 70, but 65, we're getting better fuel efficiency. Plus, with, with the, the ability to track vehicles and, and equipment with GPS, in the average speed, you can tell a lot of those things, so they can they can have them checked back in. So I, I know, but I'm just saying, if you guys would even think about looking at that Absolutely. too, because yeah, and it's those kinds of things that you know, we're a citizen legislature. We're there for 90 days, and everybody thinks we're smarter than everybody else. <laughs> no, I was in the one third of my graduate high school class that made the upper two thirds possible. So that tells you something. <laughs> you know, we don't know. I was with you. <laughs> We don't know a lot of what we don't know. Right. And it's just important to keep hearing that. And then if you make a bad decision, then let's go back and try to correct it and, and improve it so that we're not operating into that same. Uh, I mean, right now we're stuff. running, he's running, he doesn't have his trailer on. And the difference between 65 and 75 or 70 mm -hmm. is about three miles to the gallon. Or three gallons to the mile. Mm -hmm. No, three miles three to the gallon. Miles to the gallon. <laughs> So I mean I can I can start laying out evidence right now because he's running with no trailer on and mm -hmm. just running that same road and running with and without the trailer. I mean I can I can start giving you guys evidence right now what's happening. And I think it's important if you've got evidentiary information you can pass them on. Okay. Please do that. I'd be happy to take that and bring that up as a topic. And like I said, I found a study for from when they went from fifty five to sixty five and what the increase in the braking distance was. Yeah. That's what worries me. Because cars are so notorious for getting in front of somebody and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they can't see it. But you pay more gas tax. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's not. And then I have to go through okay, that. I mean, as as, 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 as I have yeah. talked, I have sorry, to go through sorry, this sorry. whole thing of making <laughs> sure every state gets their taxes and all yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And the excise fees on these tires. And yeah. let's not even get into all that. I can tell you on our trip up here, 1,200 miles, we saw more alligators in the road than we've ever seen. Huge. I mean, like the whole thing was there. I uh, don't know what that was about, but it certainly wasn't from the warmth that we've been having here <laughs> lately. Well, how, how close to Montana were these alligators? That would be That's important the question. If they were in Wyoming or Utah, then we got a problem. I don't know. I, they're leaned right up into the Spokane. I don't know. Of course, I don't know. In West California, they're still in first gear down there, so I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, I read Missoulian about the math the kids are not very good at and in reading. What is your idea how we can bring that up? You know, I, I spent 12 years in the field of education, although I was only in the classroom three of those years. And I was not a great teacher. I know some great teachers, and I know what makes a great teacher. I don't believe I have this quality. Well, I, I guess like anything else you can develop them, but part of what we need to do is, is get rid of a curriculum that's a mile wide and an inch deep and go back to focusing on basic kinds of things. Because if you look at the countries that are kicking our rear end right now, they focus on math, they focus on science, they focus on technology, they so focus on um, you know, engineering kinds of things, just the, the whole STEM program. That's what they're looking at doing. They're looking at the basic core things. And kids today are not reading as much as they should. I, I've set up, we're actually we're in the process of setting up a program for our grandkids saying, if you read a book this summer that's this many pages long, we're gonna make it different for the different age groups, we're gonna pay you for it. I, I can't think of any better way to invest my money in my grandkids than have them do things like that. But we have to concentrate, uh, we have to take back school boards and be able to wrest away control of our schools from the federal government because they're the ones that are telling us, here's what we need, here's what you need to teach in the classrooms there. And we're finding out that, you know, I'm sorry, that doesn't work. If you look at a lot of the charter schools, the specialized schools that focus on a particular uh, area of study, and they say, we're going to make sure that kids are as skilled as they possibly can be in that area, those kids are having success. I mean, I, I think it'd be a great idea to have a school that, that prepared kids for engineering. And you just, if kids have a preponderance for learning that, send them off to that school. If it's a performing arts school, send them to that school if you want to. Whatever the case is, put them in a curriculum that identifies and allows them to attain the success that they want. We had a bill that was going to help increase the amount of funding for career and technolo technology education. 
which would be basically kids who would be you know, boys and girls, welders, pipe fitters, engine or uh, uh, linemen, uh, uh, electricians, those kinds of things. That died, and to me, that was an important piece of legislation. Had we gotten that through, because we would be training kids for jobs that are going unfulfilled right now, and we need to really focus our attention on that. But to me, it, it gets back to basics. You know, I, I remember doing the times tables when I was in grade school, yeah. and have my teeth. I mean, I, I, you know, we had a guy that said, "You learn uh, better from people that look like you." I should be wearing a black habit with a white crown around because I was educated by nuns. So they didn't look anything like me. I didn't look anything like them. But, you know, you learn pretty quick, you know, how to get from 1 times 1 up to 12 times 12. And I know how to do that. And my kids today, you know, going through some of these new maths, they go, well, you do all these things. And they go, no, you don't. Here's what you do. That's not the way the teacher teaches it. They're going, that's part of the problem. We have a federal top-down instead of a bottom-up kind of so we need to really focus on the dress up. Later. You were lucky. I had to go through on a 15 time table. I had to go to 15, not 12. 225. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be wrong. The, the, the big answer is the Masons, the Masons mm -hmm. uh, support bikes for reading. Mm -hmm. And they, we go throughout the whole county and give, give uh, bikes to kids that read. Kids are reading, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to bring up the reading level. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't understand what you're reading, We've all heard that readers are leaders, and that's what happens when you can articulate a position because you've read about it, you've studied it, well, you're, you're much more effective at what you do. Or if you need to go find an answer to something, go find it. Because we can't, we can't pour as much knowledge into us as we'd like to have, but we have the ability to access just about anything right now online in you know, a couple of seconds. Brad's got to go. I have one in the corner. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah, go ahead. Why do you say you would not run for governor? <laughs> I love my wife. <laughs> Wait a minute. And, and you love your life. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I ran for this, and, and Nancy will be able to, uh, to confirm this, when we sat down the first time, she asked my wife, what do you think of him running? And my wife said, it's the worst idea I've heard. <laughs> now, she said that, but as soon as I made the commitment to, to, to do that, she hopped right on board. Sure. And she was my biggest supporter. I don't, I don't have any, you know, I, here's, here's my basic premise. I didn't look to be a legislator. I basically asked people and I prayed a lot. And I, I asked God, I said, tell me what I should do, where I should be. And I'm not a, you know, God speaks in whispers and I'm not good at hearing whispers. I like a club over the head and then I get the message. I'll serve or I'll do whatever I can to help the state of Montana. I just don't feel like it's something that I want to do at this point. I don't have any desire or interest in it. Would I help out on someone's campaign for governor? Absolutely. But at this point in time, I'm, it's just not something that I feel in my spirit I'm being drawn to do. So that's essentially why I'm saying that. Ed? Very quickly, I have two granddaughters that are teachers. Mm -hmm. They don't know anything about the Constitution of Minnesota. <clears throat> going through all of the university training, good grades, one getting the master's. They're stupid for the Constitution. <laughs> and they're, they're not evolved yet. But I have the feeling that the legislature, perhaps through the Constitution, has delegated this job to some little group. And you people have shed your responsibility to tell them, teach capitalism. Let it be compared to socialism. Teach the Constitution. Teach them that people haven't changed in 2,000 years, and that's why the Constitution is still good. It's not something in the road. It's written to control the evils of man. Amen. To answer your question, a lot of that has to do with the incentives provided at the federal level. When they say, teach these programs, and here's money for it. And they give you enough to get you started, and then they gradually take back the financing for it. To me, that's that's like a, a drug dealer giving the first hit of something to back somebody. To the yeah, yeah, there you go. Anyway. Just to follow up on that, uh, I think you would agree with Brad that the, the problem we have with directing public schools is what to do lies right in the 1972 Montana Constitution that gives autonomy to the Board of Public Education. And uh, I mean, 
there's a lot of things we can try to do, and we've been slapped down by the courts, and we are all constitutional conservatives in this room, and we have a constitution that we must abide by. Mm -hmm. now, the, now, there is a way around that. After going on 16 years of uh, Democrat governor, uh, the, Board of Public, uh, the Board of Public Education is pretty much packed with progressives. Right. What we need is a, a good run of Republican governors, a uh, time with a Republican governor, to take back the Board of Public Education. Then we'd have a real chance within the constitutional confines that we have right now to do the sorts of things that Colonel Sperry would like to see done, and, and, and the rest of us would call on. Absolutely, and to, to pick or dovetail onto that, if you have 16 years, let's say that we're fortunate enough to elect a governor uh, for, for two terms and a Republican governor for another two terms, by putting the right people in and showing the kind of outcomes that can occur within the Board of Public Education, people can then be made aware of the fact that for 16 years under Democrat control, we didn't move the needle where we, in the direction we needed to. So to follow up on your question, I think that would be us an imperative. We need to, to elect a good conservative Republican governor who can help us put good people on the Board of Public Education. So that's for the Board of Regents. Yeah, yeah for that. Do you know, you know of one? A good Republican governor? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to limit my comment to I have my favorite horse in the race. Uh, but, you know, I, you know I'm just, I'm, I'm hopeful that God is going to allow us to get the, the right person in there, that's for sure. Any, any one of them will be better, right? Absolutely. There you go. Perfect. Um, Alan, do you have a little presentation here? Yeah, I do. But now that I'm on the floor, I'm going to say something. <laughs> I, I don't say much in here. Is it a question? No, it is a statement. We talk about education and it comes delegated from the federal government. I'm sorry, friends, I find nothing in the Constitution that gives the federal government a role in education. Not a thing. And it's time that we tell them, go away, because you're in violation of the law that makes or allows you to exist. Go away. Get out of education. If you want a role in education, then propose an amendment to the United States Constitution and delineate what your role is. Otherwise, stay the heck out of education. Amen. I, I like it. Brad, it's it my pleasure to give you a book called The Law by Frederick Bastiat. This was written in 1850, and it was written to counter Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. Bastiat being a good Frenchman. Yep. Yeah. I, I have a copy, but I will I will use this one now as my yes. My Bible. Be be people on there. There you go. I will love some of your Thank you. Well, Alan Longer. Oh, here. Wait a minute. This is my. It's ready. That's mine. Hey, one more. One more. This one. Well, it won't come out. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank you. 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 Th